So you're here for the India Economic Summit and you're coming to India at a time when there are growing global tensions when it comes to global trade between China and the United States, between India and uh, the United States. How do you see this play out in the context of the world order that the World Economic Forum has played such an important role in shaping? I have to take it uh, from a more fundamental point of view. The World Economic Forum uh, was always based on combining entrepreneurship with social responsibility. And actually in 86 already I wrote a very famous article uh, in the New York Times that uh, globalization in its present form is not sustainable. We have to um, uh, combine uh, free markets and multilateralism um, with, a, with policies which preserve the social cohesion in a country. And what we see at the moment and what is one of the main causes for the turbulences we see in the world is that on the one hand uh, we need still open markets but they clash with the necessity to take care of those who have been left behind. So my answer is we will fight for this uh, compromise I wouldn't say a compromise, but the combination of uh, an open global system, but at the same time reinforce the social component. All the noises that we're seeing on increasing tariffs and the action that we've seen already over the past few months, do you believe this is a part of an elaborate bargaining tactic or do you think we're now headed to an era of very serious trade wars between major economic powers? It's more than a trade war. Um, so are two reasons. The first one is, uh, with the fast pace of change, people in general have developed a kind of what I call bunker mentality, which means you retrench and you want to preserve what you have, uh, particularly in the industrialized countries. Uh, and that leads to more egoism, and more egoism leads to populism, more populism leads, of course, to protectionism. So that's one factor uh, which we see. But um, uh, what we also see is the effect of the fourth industrial revolution, the fast technological change. People are afraid of the future. And what we see is not so much a trade war, it's actually a war who will be the leader in the fourth industrial revolution. Do not forget uh, China was the leading nation uh, until the end of the 18th century and it lost out because it didn't recognize the significance and it didn't have the possibility to recognize the significance of the first industrial revolution, second and third, which made the UK and the US the global power. Now we have the struggle who will really command the fourth industrial revolution and its technology like artificial so intelligence? What's your sense of who's best placed at this time to lead the world into the fourth industrial revolution? Because you pretty much created this term. We're seeing the kind of technological strides that China has made with Huawei, with the 5G technology. Do you believe that this could potentially be China's time once again? We, we should make here uh, again a, a, let's say, a differentiation. On the one hand, we have uh, state capitalism. On the other hand, we have shareholder or private capitalism. So it's a clash between two systems. I, I believe that um, state capitalism in the short term in the short term provides a certain advantages because you can mobilize in a concentrated way a lot of resources to reach a specific objective. But I believe that the future is not state capitalism or shareholder capitalism. The future is what I call stakeholder capitalism which um, is combined with the social responsibility. A lot of the trade tensions that we're seeing have been caused recently by a new aggressive American mindset where Donald Trump is now pushing, seeking to claim back some of the concessions uh, which past US administrations had rolled out to the developing world. 
uh, countries like India feel that because of the growing problems with China, India is being unfairly targeted? Yes, but it's not uh, 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 President Trump alone. I think you have to see behind him his electorate, um, which was a majority. Um, so what we are seeing is um, that there is, on the one hand, there is a global interdependence. We are a global, um, we all share a global destiny. On the other hand, on the other hand, um, politicians have to serve uh, their people and the more and more short-term interests of their people. So um, this type will not go away with President Trump. I think um, as long as we do not have stronger social cohesion in the countries, there will always be a pressure to defend particularly national interests. Are you concerned that in the contest between short-term populist interests and the larger interests of world trade, politics will win and economics and free trade will lose? Uh, I'm, I am concerned and uh, the World Economic Forum um, works hard uh, to show uh, that uh, open markets are in the interest of everybody, but, but uh, we probably have to combine our global policies more with policies which protect those who are left behind. Because they can raise now their voice very uh, vehemently. You've spoken about the emergence of two major circles of influence in the new economic order. The American circle of influence, the Chinese circle of influence, do you believe countries like India will need to choose which of the two circles of influence they want to be in because China is a neighbor just across the mountains? Yes, but don't forget um, uh, India now in terms of uh, purchasing power is already the third largest economy in the world. So I, I wouldn't see the world just in terms of two big circles. I would see the world maybe with two big circles but a lot of smaller circles which are overlapping and I, I could well see the Indian maybe at the beginning smaller circle but overlapping with the American and with the Chinese circle which would give a particular advantage to the uh, Indian economy. You've been a dear friend of India for decades. How do you see India being placed to leverage uh, what the fourth industrial revolution have to offer. You've set up a fourth industrial revolution center in Mumbai, but is that enough when it comes to blockchain, artificial intelligence, automation? How set is India? I think India has a great potential in this respect. I remember when I came first here 35 years ago, everybody was complaining about the bureaucracy, about corruption, um, about uh, stifling private enterprise, Today it has um, completely changed. I think uh, private business is flourishing, even if a private business will always complain, but it's flourishing. You see a very vibrant uh, entrepreneurial um, uh, new class coming up um, with, uh, let's say, good education. Education is key with uh, language capabilities, with uh, excellent uh, soft infrastructure, which means particularly mobile access and so on, uh, India uh, can be one of the winners of the fourth industrial revolution. That's my big belief. What more do you believe India needs to do to be able to ride the new economic waves? I think uh, education is key. We, we, not only India, we still have an educational system which was born in the first industrial revolution, we need completely rethink our um, educational system to make people more entrepreneurial. But um, let's not forget, we will have to compete in the future with robots. So we have to ask ourselves what makes us different from a robot and we should cultivate particularly those traits and those capab capabilities which uh, allow people still uh, to perform in a special way in this new um, post-industrial environment. So education 
the creation of um, environment and um, uh, innovation friendly ecosystems. I think those are the areas um, where our governments have to make sure that they invest enough um, to guarantee uh, competitive advantage of the country.